Welcome back, Deep Divers. Today, we're going deep into the mines of 18th century Germany. St. Altenkirchen, to be exact. A region, you might say, uh, between the Siegerland and Westerwald. Okay. Now, before you click away thinking, uh, mining, that's a little too niche for me. Trust me, this one's got twists and turns you won't believe. Well, especially when you consider our main source, we're talking Alexander von Humboldt. You know, the Humboldt, the Cosmos guy. That's the one. But before all the globe trotting, he was a mining expert just starting out. And his 1795 report on St. Altenkirchen, well, let's just say it gives us a glimpse into the mind of a young Humboldt before the fame, before Cosmos. It's like we're getting a sneak peek behind the curtain, seeing the scientific superstar in the making. Right. And to add even more depth, we've also got writings from Bergeret Kramer, another mining expert of the time. Two perspectives, one fascinating deep dive. Absolutely. And together, these sources don't just tell us about the mines themselves, but the whole picture, the challenges miners faced, the innovations they came up with, like um, even their approach to forestry, the Hallberg system, they called it. Really interesting stuff. OK, I'm already intrigued, but let's set the stage first. What was St. Altenkirchen like back then? Give us the lay of the land. Well, imagine a small territory, right, nestled between those two regions, Siegerland and Westerwald. Mining was everywhere. Iron, copper, lead. They even had cobalt mines. Bustling, you could say, but politically, oh, it's complicated. Complicated how? Well, they had this ruler, the Margrave of Brandenburg, Ansbach, Beirut, long title, not much interest in the place. <laughs> so it was eventually handed over to Prussia. Ah, Prussia, always shaking things up. Right. And that created a very unique situation, one that definitely influenced Humboldt's work there. Okay, so we've got a neglected region suddenly thrown into the arms of Prussia. And then enter Alexander von Humboldt, our young up-and-coming mining expert. He was already making a name for himself. Studied under Abraham Gottlob Werner, you know, the Freiburg Mining Academy. The big leagues. <laughs> exactly. And what's fascinating is how this early work, this St. Altenkirchen report, kind of foreshadows his later bigger ideas. Okay, now you've really got me hooked. How does digging around in these German mines connect to, like, exploring the Amazon and writing Cosmos? You'll see. As we go through the report, you'll notice these little details, these observations, the way he analyzes not just the rocks, but the economics, the people. It's, it's all connected, like a seed that grows into something much bigger. I can't wait to see how it all unfolds. So let's get down to the details. What were some of the specific mines Humboldt documented in St. Altenkirchen? Oh, he covered a whole range. But one that stands out is the Hollertzug iron mine near Dürmbach. It was known for, well, the high quality or really important for supplying the region's ironworks. And were there any other notable mines? Oh, absolutely. The Goldenheart Iron Mine, also near Dürmbach, was another one he documented. And it wasn't just iron. There was the Malscheid Mine near Herdorf, which had silver, lead, and copper, and even a cobalt mine near Kirchen. Wow, a real mix. It sounds like this region was a mineralogist's dream. But what about the miners themselves? What was their life like? You know, Humboldt was really impressed by them, especially the ones from the Westerwald. He talked about how strong and skilled they were. They used these tools, Schlegel and Eisen, hammer and chisel, basically. Sounds brutal. It was tough work. But Humboldt considered their work total fray, blameless, impeccable. He even commented on their clothes, like how practical they were, but also the little differences between regions, you know, like their uniforms almost. Fascinating. It's like he's capturing a snapshot of their lives, not just the rocks they're digging up, yeah. but all this hard work. Was it paying off? What was the economic situation of these mining operations? That's where things get a little, well, complicated. Humboldt's report paints a bit of a worrisome picture. He talks about a growing number of Subusechen, subsidized mines. Meaning? They were getting financial help just to stay afloat, not exactly a sign of a booming industry. So what was going wrong? Why were they struggling? A few reasons, actually. Humboldt pointed to the rising costs, both for labor and materials. But he was especially critical of the tax system, thought it was way too heavy, hurting both the miners and the industry itself. That's bold. I mean, for a mining official to criticize the government's taxes. He didn't hold back. He even pleaded for tax relief to encourage what he called Schurflust. Schurflust. Now, that's a word I haven't heard before. It means, uh, how do you say, prospecting zeal? Basically, that passion for discovery and exploration. Right. He thought that easing the burden on the miners would bring that spirit back. It shows you he wasn't just thinking about rocks and numbers. He cared about the people, the whole system. 
Absolutely. And that's something you'll see throughout his work, this awareness of how everything is connected, the human element, the economics, the environment. So we've got the mines themselves, the miners struggling, the taxes. What about the actual process of turning all that raw material into something usable? What about the ironworks? Well, they have this unique system in St. Altenkirchen. They called it Einzelhuten, individual furnaces, you could say. So like each owner had their own setup. Not quite. They actually shared furnaces, multiple owners using the same one. Huh. That's interesting. What were the advantages of doing it that way? Well, for one, it was more flexible. Smaller producers could get in on the action without having to invest in their own furnace. Made things easier, especially with the way the mineral deposits were scattered around. Sounds good in theory. Yeah. But I imagine sharing a furnace could get a little complicated. You're telling me scheduling, maintenance, making sure everyone's using it fairly. It had its challenges for sure. I bet. Yeah. Okay, before we get lost in the details of furnace sharing, let's bring back our other main source. For great Kramer, hmm. how does he add to our understanding of all this? Well, Kramer actually wrote about Humboldt's visit to the region back in 1794. And it's fascinating. He gives us this behind the scenes look at how Humboldt worked. Even with limited time, he managed to gather so much information about different types of mines, the geology, the problems they faced, really meticulous. So Kramer was like Humboldt's chronicler in a way. Did they always agree or did things get a little tense between the outsider expert and the local guy. Oh, that's where things get really interesting, especially when you bring in another local expert, Bergmeister Stein. He was the official in charge of the Hollert Z iron mine, remember? And according to Kramer, Humboldt's assessment of that mine, well, it didn't exactly line up with what Stein was saying. Uh-oh. Sounds like a clash of opinions brewing. What were they disagreeing about? The Hollert Zug mine, despite being rich in ore, was getting harder to work. Humboldt saw that. He pointed to problems like water seepage and other technical difficulties. Stein, on the other hand, was more optimistic. He focused on the mine's potential, downplayed the problems. Classic optimist versus pragmatist scenario. So did Humboldt just brush off the local guy's opinion? Nope, not Humboldt. He acknowledged the potential, but he didn't shy away from the challenges either. In fact, he even proposed a solution for the water seepage problem. Okay, I'm intrigued. What did he suggest? He thought they should dig a new drainage at it, basically a tunnel to improve ventilation and water management within the mine. Very practical, very humbled. Always looking for solutions, not just pointing out problems. It's making me wonder, how did all these different viewpoints and you know conflicting opinions affect Humboldt's overall take on the region's mining industry? That's a great question and one we'll delve into in the next part of our deep dive. We'll uncover how Humboldt navigated those choppy waters and how his final report ultimately shaped the future of mining in St. Altenkirchen. Stay tuned. Okay, I'm already on the edge of my seat. But before we wrap up this part, is there anything our listeners should be thinking about as we get ready to dig even deeper into these historical archives? I'll leave you with this. Both Humboldt and Kramer were quite fascinated by this thing called the Hallberg system. It was a unique form of forestry they practiced in the region. Think about how this system, which was all about ensuring a steady supply of charcoal for the ironworks, might have sparked some ideas in Humboldt's mind. Ideas that would later blossom into his grand vision of an interconnected natural world. It's like those early experiences, even the ones that seem small or insignificant, were shaping his thinking in ways he probably didn't even realize at the time. Exactly. And that's the beauty of exploring these historical sources. You never know what connections you might uncover. I can't wait to see where this deep dive takes us next. You know, it really makes you think, doesn't it? about how those early observations, like the Hallberg system, might have planted the seeds for Humboldt's later ideas about sustainability. It's like we're seeing those connections forming right before our eyes. It's fascinating. But before we get too far ahead, let's get back to those clashing opinions we were talking about, especially about that hollard soak mine. Did Humboldt end up siding with Bergmeister Stein, or did he stick to his own assessment? Well, Humboldt, being Humboldt, he took a very nuanced approach. He didn't dismiss Stein's perspective. He actually acknowledged the mine's potential. But he also didn't shy away from the problems he'd observed. So he didn't just ignore the local expert's opinion? Not at all. In fact, he went a step further and actually proposed a solution to deal with that water seepage issue. Remember, that was a major concern he'd highlighted. Right. So what did he have in mind? He suggested they dig a new drainage at it basically a tunnel to help with ventilation and water flow within the mine. A very practical, hands-on approach. Typical Humboldt, always looking for solutions. But it also brings up that tension between, you know, wanting to make the mine 
profitable, and also being mindful of the environmental impact. Finding that balance can be tough. Absolutely. And Humboldt was very aware of that. He understood that responsible resource management, that's key to long-term success. And that includes looking after the miners' well-being, too. Okay, so we've talked about the different opinions, the challenges, but what was the actual impact of Humboldt's report? Did it lead to any real changes in St. Altenkirchen? Well, it's hard to say for sure. Remember, the region was in a kind of limbo, waiting to officially become part of Prussia. So things were still up in the air. Right. But what Humboldt did was provide a solid foundation for a more informed approach to mining. He emphasized the importance of data, of economic analysis, of thinking long term. And those ideas definitely resonated with the Prussian mining administration that took over a few years later. So even if his report didn't lead to immediate changes, it planted the seeds for a more, I guess you could say, scientific and sustainable approach to mining. Exactly. It's like a ripple effect. And you can see how this experience, even though it might seem small compared to his later work, played a role in shaping his overall approach to science, his understanding of how everything's connected. Nature, human activity, economics. It's like we're uncovering those early building blocks of his thinking. Now, before we move on, there's something that really caught my attention in the report. Humboldt spends quite a bit of time describing the miners' uniforms. Why was he so interested in something like that? You know, it's those little details that often reveal the most insightful things about Humboldt. Remember, he was a keen observer, not just of nature, but of people, of culture. He was fascinated by how people adapted to their environment, and their clothing was a reflection of that. So it wasn't about fashion, it was about understanding the practicalities of their lives, how they interacted with their surroundings. Precisely. He even goes into detail, describing the different elements, the materials. He mentions Straubelben Unterkleidern, straw yellow undergarments, Sehaklut on Burgleder, mining hats and leather. He even notes the silver trim on the foreman's jackets. It's like he's painting a picture with words. Those details really bring it to life. It's like we're right there with him, watching those miners go about their day. And that's what makes Humboldt so compelling as a writer. He combines those detailed observations with these broader scientific insights. He helps us see the connections, the patterns that emerge from those seemingly small details. Which brings us back to the Hauberg system, right? Another example of how he saw the bigger picture. Absolutely. Remember, the Hauberg system was all about sustainable forestry, this complex system of shared ownership, making sure there was always enough charcoal for the ironworks. Right. And it wasn't just about the technical aspects. He was interested in the social and ecological dimensions as well how those communities interacted with the forest, how they managed those resources. Exactly. He saw it as a model, a microcosm of how humans could live in harmony with nature in a way that benefits everyone. And those ideas, that sense of balance and interconnectedness would become central to his later work. It's like a preview of his later writings on the environment, on the impact of human activity on the planet. You're seeing the evolution of his thinking, how those early experiences shaped his worldview, and that's what makes these deep dives so rewarding. We get to uncover those hidden connections, those moments of inspiration that shaped the course of history. It's amazing to see how it all ties together. Now, before we move on to the final part of our deep dive, there's one more thing I wanted to touch on. Humboldt mentions a plan for a free Bergschule in Dernbach. Can you tell us a little more about that? Ah, uh, yes. The Free Bergschule, the Free Mining School. It was a fascinating proposal, very forward thinking. Basically, he wanted to create a school that would provide free training and education for anyone who wanted to become a miner. Wow, that's pretty progressive. It shows he wasn't just focused on improving the technical aspects of mining, but also on investing in the people in creating opportunities. Exactly. He understood that a thriving industry needed skilled workers, and he wanted to make sure everyone had access to that knowledge. It's a testament to his social conscience, his belief in the power of education. It's amazing how every detail we uncover reveals another layer of depth to Humboldt's work. And with that, I think we're ready to move on to the final part of our deep dive. It really challenges our image of Humboldt, doesn't it? He wasn't just this, you know, scientist exploring the world. He was thinking about social issues, about sustainability, about education way ahead of his time. Absolutely. It's like all these different aspects, science, economics, social justice, the environment, they're all woven together in his thinking. And that's something we can still learn from today. But before we get too philosophical, I wanted to go back to something you mentioned earlier. Humboldt was pretty critical of the tax system, right? But did he offer any solutions? I mean, it's one thing to point out problems, but what about concrete alternatives? 
That's a great point, and it shows you how Humboldt's mind worked. He wasn't just complaining, he was actually trying to find ways to make things better. And in his report, he does outline some pretty progressive ideas. Okay, I'm all ears. What did he propose? Well, he was a big advocate for simplifying the tax code. He thought the existing system was way too complicated, you know, a, a real burden, and that it discouraged investment and hindered growth. He believed a more streamlined, transparent system would be better for everyone. Makes sense. Anything else? He also championed free trade. He thought removing barriers to commerce would really boost the region's economy, create new opportunities for the mining industry. He saw San Altenkirchen's potential, but he knew those taxes were holding it back. So he was thinking beyond just the mines themselves. He saw the bigger picture, the interconnectedness of the whole economic system. Exactly. And remember, this was long before globalization was even a thing. He was way ahead of the curve on that one. Fascinating. You know, it's amazing how all these themes we've been talking about, sustainability, social responsibility, economic interconnectedness, they all come together in Humboldt's thinking, even at this early stage in his career. But it's important to remember the historical context too, right? St. Altenkirchen was about to become part of Prussia. How did that transition affect the mining industry there? And did Humboldt's report play any role in that? That's a crucial part of the story. The Prussians, they were known for their efficiency, their centralized control. They had a whole different approach to managing things. They wanted to modernize the mines, boost production, you know, really maximize their profits. So a much more hands-on approach compared to the, well, somewhat hands-off style of the Margrave. Exactly. And while Humboldt's report was written before the Prussians took over, his ideas about data collection, economic analysis, long-term planning, those definitely resonated with their way of thinking. It's possible his recommendations even influenced some of the reforms they implemented. It's remarkable how his work, which was written for a specific situation, could be so easily applied to a different context. It speaks to the timelessness of his ideas. But before we wrap up this deep dive, I want to bring it back to the present. Why should we, you know, here in the 21st century, care about a young Humboldt's mining report from the 1790s? What's the relevance for us today? That's the big question, isn't it? And I think there are a few key takeaways. First, it reminds us that even the greatest minds, they all start somewhere. Humboldt's later achievements, the explorations, the groundbreaking scientific work, it was all built on this foundation of careful observation, meticulous analysis, and a willingness to challenge the status quo. It wasn't all, you know, glamorous adventures and revolutionary discoveries. Mm -hmm. He had to put in the work, pay his dues. Exactly. And that's an important lesson for all of us. Success often comes from those small steps, those moments of careful observation, of thinking critically. And Humboldt's work in St. Altenkirchen, it embodies that process. Right. It's not just about achieving some grand goal. It's about the journey, the process of learning and growing along the way. And speaking of learning, Humboldt's approach in this report highlights the importance of looking beyond the surface, of making connections between different fields. He wasn't just a mining expert. He was a scientist, an economist, a social observer, all rolled into one. A true polymath. And that kind of interdisciplinary thinking, it's more important than ever today, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Especially as we face these complex challenges, mm. climate change, resource depletion, social inequality. We need that holistic perspective, that ability to see the big picture, just like Humboldt did. And finally, I think Humboldt's story reminds us that Progress shouldn't come at the expense of people or the planet. He was a champion for sustainability, for the well-being of the miners, for a fairer economic system. Those values are just as relevant today as they were back then. As we face the consequences of, you know, unchecked industrial growth, we need to remember that true progress has to be sustainable and equitable. And Humboldt's work, even from centuries ago, it serves as a powerful reminder of that. Well, I think we've unearthed some real gems in this deep dive, not just about 18th century mining, but about the development of a scientific giant and the enduring power of his ideas. Any final thoughts for our listeners as they emerge from the mines and mines of the Cedarland? Here's something to ponder. We've seen how Humboldt's early work in St. Altenkirchen foreshadowed his later, more global perspective. So think about a challenge you're facing, a project that maybe seems outside your comfort zone. How could you apply Humboldt's approach? his meticulous observation, his interdisciplinary thinking, his commitment to connecting the dots. Could those same principles help you uncover hidden insights and achieve a deeper understanding? That's a great question to leave our listeners with. And on that note, we'll bring this deep dive to a close. I hope you've enjoyed our journey and that you'll join us again next time for another fascinating exploration. Until then, happy deep diving.